Why don't we get it, give it a few more minutes for uh, the, all of the participants to load. Yeah, the participants are loading and when we get to a stable point, I'll, I'll start, but the system is still adding people. I think people are probably still joining. Okay, welcome to today's US ACPI webinar, the second in our summer series on Black Lives Matter, Israeli annexation and BDS, which my US ACPI colleague, Terry Ginsburg of the American University in Cairo will introduce in a moment. I am Daniel Siegel of Pitzer College, which is providing the Zoom hosting for this webinar. I want to begin by acknowledging that as part of the Claremont Consortium of Colleges outside of Los Angeles, Pitzer College is located on the territory of the Tongva, Sereno, and Ohlone people, and that the college's presence in this place continues the project of settler colonialism. We at the Claremont Colleges must seek to resist, to disturb, and to work through this settler colonial facet of racial capitalism along with its other facets, including its devaluing of black lives to reach a future defined by restorative justice. That we convene here today virtually, not physically, should not mean we neglect to remember the college's occupation of indigenous land. I also want to acknowledge that though Pitzer College's faculty, students and staff voted overwhelmingly in 2019 to suspend Pitzer College's study abroad program inside the Israeli state. Pitzer College's president vetoed the suspension, leaving Pitzer College complicit also in Israeli state apartheid, occupation, and ethnic cleansing. Despite this veto, the Claremont College's chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace and many student, staff, and faculty allies remain committed to Palestinian freedom and equality. Finally, I want to thank the great professional staff at Pitzer College, particularly Jessica Levy and John Morgan for providing the IT support for this webinar. Terry Ginsburg will now introduce the webinar. Terry. Terry, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, Dan, and welcome. Thank you everyone for tuning in to the second in a series of webinars that the US Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, US ACBI, is organizing and hosting this summer in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and the global anti-racist uprising. As most of you know, our, the topic of our series is Black Lives Matter, Israeli annexation, and BDS anti-apartheid, anti-colonial perspectives. My name is Terry Ginsburg. I'm a film scholar and Palestine solidarity worker, and I will be moderating today's webinar. We are pleased and honored to have with us as guest speakers today, Christian Davis Bailey of Black for Palestine and Dr. Rada Karmi of the University of Exeter, along with Mohamed Nabulsi of the Palestine Youth Movement, who will serve as discussant. Now I will introduce our guests in more detail shortly, but first let me say something briefly about US ACPI. US ACPI is a campaign 
that responding to the call of Palestinian civil society to join the boycott, divestment, and sanctions or BDS movement against Israel focuses specifically on a boycott of Israeli academic and cultural institutions as delineated by the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel or PACB. PACB and the entire movement for BDS emphasize fundamental Palestinian rights, which have been sanctioned by international law and universal, universal human rights principles that must be respected by Israel in order for the boycott to end. U.S. ACB takes a public principled stance in support of equality, self-determination, human rights, including the right to education, and genuine democracy, especially in view of the censorship and silencing of the Palestinian question in U.S. universities, as well as in U.S. society at large. We believe that there can be no academic freedom in historic Palestine unless all academic scholars and all students everywhere are guaranteed their right to education, including the freedom to pursue their academic desires, interests, goals, and dreams. Today's webinar confronts these issues in the context of two major current events, the global Black Lives Matter uprising and the Israeli annexation of the occupied Palestinian territories. How are the Black Lives, and here are some, some possible questions that we will be grappling with today. How are the Black and Palestine liberation struggles related? What role have Black activists played in the Palestine Solidarity Movement, both in the US, uh, including on campuses and in Palestine? And by the same token, how can the Palestine Movement best be responsive to and support the demands of the movement for Black lives? Is colonialism the common thread of global liberation struggles today? What in this context are the political determinants and implications of annexation for those engaged in struggle against apartheid and Zionism? What should the Palestine Solidarity Movement's response be to annexation in terms of possible strategies and tactics at this historical moment? What must change and what might stay the same with respect to that response? What new obstacles might we also be facing under these altered conditions? And what possibilities are emerging today out of Black Palestinian solidarities? Now, our webinar today will proceed as follows. Each of our two guests will talk for 15 or so minutes, followed by a five minute commentary by our discussant, followed by approximately 30 minutes of Q&A from those of you in attendance. We ask that you submit your comments via the chat box and your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you would like to ask your question verbally, please use the raise hand function to let us know, but please keep in mind that time is limited, so we would urge you to submit your questions via the Q&A function in your Zoom application. So without further ado, our first speaker is Christian Davis Bailey, who is a writer and organizer based in Chicago. His work is focused on intersections between the Black and Palestinian struggles and Black internationalism. He is a co-author of the 2015 Black 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 Solidarity with Palestine Statement, signed by over 1,000 Black activists, including Angela Davis, Cornel West, and Mumia Abu-Jamal. His work has taken him to Brazil, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, and South Africa. Welcome, Christian. Thank you, Terry, um, and thank you to everybody at USACB for uh, hosting this conversation and, and for including me. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we can just jump straight into it. We are in a moment of uh, Black uprising. We're in a moment of a global pandemic. Um, and we're in a moment that's really exposing a lot of the um, fractures, fissures, and, and needs for humanity um, in terms of everything, in terms of health, in terms of race, in terms of um, uh, how, how capitalism operates, how the state operates. Um, so there's a lot of urgent questions to be answered and a lot of urgent actions that um, we need to take. And, and I plan to delve into some of those today. Um, so normally in one of these conversations, I would give an overview of the development in Black and Palestinian solidarity over the last five or six years. Um, but I, I think most people here kind of know that story or have an idea of what happened in the years since Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson and the Black Lives Matter movement launched and, and the delegations of uh, Black, Black Lives Matter groups to Palestine. Um, in this moment, I actually just want to focus solely on the conditions and, and needs of the Black struggle. Um, and a lot of these comments you can find in an article I published in the Electronic Intifada 
uh, called How Palestine Advocates Can Support Black Struggle. Um, so if there's three takeaways that I hope people get from the few minutes I have um, sitting the timer. Um, it's one to understand that the black struggle is a struggle against racism, but it is primarily a struggle against uh, colonialism and imperialism with racism as kind of the, the glue that holds those systems together. Um, and that our struggle in this moment is about our ability to live, but it's also about our ability to liberate ourselves from the oppression that we faced for over four centuries. Um, and for any conversation that we're having that's rooted in the so-called United States, um, we have to acknowledge that the ground that we're standing on um, is rooted in anti-Indigenous and anti-Black um, kind of policies and practices um, that are embedded in every aspect of life in this country. And so um, whether you're tuning in from a university or as a cultural worker, um, uh, we all kind of inherit these, these systems of violence and oppression um, and have a, a duty to resist them um, to the fullest degree possible. Um, so turning to my article, um, the inspiration for this article came about um, following the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, and the protests that were sparked around the country. But uh, both as an individual and as a member of Black for Palestine, we were receiving lots of questions about um, how can we be in better support or solidarity with the Black struggle in this moment, specifically from Palestine solidarity activists and um, the Arab American community. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to summarize a few of the points from this article. Um, the first is I've already stated, but it's just to understand that the Black struggle at its core is a struggle, a 500 year struggle against imperialism and colonialism, and it's a struggle for self-determination. Um, if, if this isn't clear, just think about what it means to, um, for a, many groups of people to have their status as indigenous people uprooted, to be removed from a continent, brought to another continent, enslaved for 200 or 300 years, um, and then forced to live under a system of, of racial subjugation in a country to which none, none of us ever asked to be in um, and never had any say in, in, in our citizenship. Um, so um, in the same way as, as the Palestine struggle is at its core about self-determination, so too is the Black struggle, um, even though people don't tend to think of our struggle in that way. Um, we are, are one of the first and largest victims of Western colonialism and racial capitalism and for 500 years have never received any form of, of justice or uh, reparations for this violence. Um, and so when we look at the United States, we understand that it is an illegitimate settler colony built on the ethnic cleansing of the indigenous population and the enslavement of Africans. And that not only is this something that happened in the past, but the United States requires each of these two um, things to continue in order to maintain its domination of this territory and of lands and peoples abroad. Um, and so it's for this reason that uh, uh, Black rebellion, Black revolution, um, Black organizing is, is viewed as a, one of the greatest, if not the greatest internal threat to the imperial power of the United States. Um, and we saw this in the last real moment of Black revolution in the 60s and 70s in the ways in which the Black Panther Party and other Black revolutionaries were attacked, killed, um, imprisoned, and, and, and just targeted. Um, the next thing to understand is, is that there are three kind of primary ways that racism operates in the United States. It's uh, against indigenous people, against Black folks, and um, against victims of, of, of US imperialism abroad, which we tend to call immigrants. Um, but it's really important to understand that um, most of us, as I said already, are inheriting or benefiting from um, genocide and, and colonialism of indigenous land um, and benefiting even if we come from groups that are, are victims of imperialism or experience oppression. Um, if, if we're not black and if we're not indigenous, we are inheriting um, an entire system of, of privilege and, and power that's structured against those two populations. Um, and so if, if we, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, I think in this moment, it's very important to deepen our support for black organizing and black struggle um, beyond kind of the usual, usual suspects, beyond the, the well-known groups and the national organizations. Um, it's really important to understand that in every part of the country, um, there are black people actively um, working for freedom and working to resist the systems of oppression around us. 
there are black farmers and land stewards that are working to secure land and resources for the communities to be self-sufficient. Um, there are meeting spaces for black radical organizations that are facing displacement due to gentrification. Um, in every city, there are former black panthers and elder black revolutionaries that need to transfer knowledge to future generations. Um, and so beyond groups like Black for Palestine, it's really important for um, everybody, but Palestine solidarity or activists in particular, to build relationships with a broader set of, of, of Black um, organizations. And as a corollary to this, I, I think it's really important to invest time, relationships, and resources into our communities and into our struggles. Um, so many of us have paid money, in some cases thousands of dollars, to travel to Palestine to learn from um, activists on the ground to see conditions of struggle. Um, we can very easily do the same thing with much less money spent um, to spend time in Black communities in Detroit, in Chicago, or Jackson, Mississippi. Um, if you've been to Palestine to help harvest olives in the West Bank and prevent settlers from taking over Palestinian land, you can very easily visit a Black farmer um, in, in your own city to help them harvest um, vegetables and protect their land from gentrifiers who are also settlers. Um, similarly, if we defend Palestinian homes from being uh, demolished, we can defend Black families from being evicted um, from their own homes. Um, I think the point I'm trying to make here is that um, if we are giving significant amounts of time and resources to um, supporting the liberation of Palestine, which is necessary, um, we also need to be investing that same level of energy and, and um, uh, resources into Black and Indigenous struggle here um, and, and occupied Turtle Island. Um, another point to understand that I've seen many people iterate um, over the years is to understand that Israel's violence is not unique or exceptional. Um, in, in some cases, we hear people who go and visit um, uh, Palestine and say, oh, like what Israel's doing is, is like, I've never seen anything like it. It's so horrible. Um, and this is true, it is horrible, but it also fails to acknowledge the, the centuries long history of uh, racist and colonial violence that takes place both within the so-called United States and um, to indigenous people around the world as the result of European colonialism. So we have to situate um, both Israel's actions and Palestinian suffering in the context of a broader history of colonialism, um, of which most people around the world in Africa, Asia, and Latin America are still fighting against today. Um, and so as a result of this, we also need to understand that supporting the Black struggle isn't just about supporting us within the borders of the US, it's about justice for the entire African diaspora for slavery and colonialism. Um, and just a short point here that we, we really need to be building connections with um, comrades and across the diaspora in the Caribbean and Latin America um, on the continent itself. Um, and, and in my experience, this is what Palestine at its best, Palestine organizing has allowed for people from different struggles and, and locations to come together, both to support Palestine, but also to build stronger connections in our, our, our global fights against colonialism and, and racism. Um, similarly, uh, th there's a need for um, stronger politics of, of abolition on this territory. So all of us very easily understand why um, the occupation, the Israeli occupation, its prisons, its military, its um, entire system of racial supremacy needs to be abolished. Um, th this is what we're calling for here in the so-called U.S. is the abolition of similar racist forms of uh, prison and policing and um, just an investment in our, our communities being able to thrive. Um, and so when I think about this conversation in the context of um, universities and, and academics um, and about the right to education, um, I don't know, just understanding the, the anti-Black and anti-Indigenous structures of this country, we know that um, these two populations in particular um, do not have a meaningful right to education. We can look at the overcrowding of um, schools in, in cities like Detroit, Chicago, or New York. We can look at um, the ability to just access um, university education. Um, and so when we think about right to education, we have to think about how can we build um, this practice specifically for black and indigenous folks on our own territory. Um, 
I might have more thoughts on that later, but um, just something that comes to mind if, if we think about reparations is what does it look like to um, advocate for for universities or, or this country to cover the education for black and indigenous people through whatever degree of, of, of education they seek. Um, understanding that, that, that for centuries um, we have had inadequate access to um, ed education. Um, but one of the, the last points I'd like to end on is, um, so specifically within the Arab American community um, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, um, I've seen a lot of questions or um, yeah, just conversations about needing to address um, anti-Black racism within the Arab American community or Arab American communities. Um, and this is a conversation that really expands to any population that's not Black um, is both how do we deal with um, kind of internal or cultural or intrapersonal racism. Um, but I think more importantly, the question is how do we materially um, remove or change or transform the conditions of oppression and racism that, that Black people face? Um, so my kind of suggestion to this, this question about um, uh, cultural anti-Blackness is that it's, it's more important to focus on um, materially investing in, in Black self-determination. And so what I mean by that is in a city like Detroit, where I lived for four years and um, just have a great respect for the, the history of Black revolutionary organizing, both past and present in that city, um, one of the issues we faced was um, being immediately adjacent to Dearborn, which is one of the largest Arab American cities in the country. And um, many of our comrades from that community would acknowledge that we need to address anti-Blackness within our families and our communities. Um, but to me, it, the, the, the more pervasive or serious issue of anti-Black racism is um, passive acceptance of conditions of Black death in a neighboring city, which includes things like water shutoffs, home foreclosures, evictions, gentrification, food apartheid, inadequate public health, and decades of disinvestment. Um, so to me, while it's important to challenge racism kind of mentally or internally, it's even more important to challenge the material conditions of racism and oppression um, that we experience. Um, and so I think that's most of what I want to offer just for opening remarks. Um, I think as we have these conversations, it's important to bring in and acknowledge the primarily working class um, organizations that have been doing meaningful work either on black liberation or solidarity with the black struggle um, that are very frequently left out of, of conversations or, or spaces um, in, in the movement today. Um, so it, it's to say that there's many kind of um, examples of, of how to be in principled solidarity with our struggle. Um, we just need to get back into a practice of, of lifting up um, the people and organizations that have been doing that work and um, getting more, more serious about that work ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Our next speaker today is Dr. Rada Karmi, who is a Palestinian doctor of medicine and academic and writer based in England. Her family was forced to leave their home in Jerusalem when Israel was established in 1948, and they ended up in London, where she grew up and studied. She has been an activist for Palestine for over 30 years and has written and lectured widely on Palestinian culture and politics. Her books include a widely acclaimed memoir, In Search of Fatima, a second memoir, Return, and several political studies. Welcome, Dr. Carmi. Thank you. Um, I, I hope I can be heard. I haven't uh, muted, I, I've muted my microphone. Okay, thank you and thank you for organizing this really very important webinar. <clears throat> and I'm delighted to hear Christian speak and uh, express uh, ideas which are uh, familiar in, in, uh, to me in the sense that I can understand perfectly well what you mean. Um, uh, now, uh, having said that, of course, we must be clear that the, the question of solidarity with, with the black, black oppression 
with black communities, wherever they might have been, was something which was very much a feature of the Palestinian struggle. The Palestine Liberation Organization, which was established in the 1960s, was particularly interested in drawing these parallels with oppressed people wherever they were in the world, that there were parallels between what was happening to them and what was happening to Palestinians. And that was a theme which was very familiar and well known to Palestinians, uh, activists and politicians and political figures. Um, and in fact, we know that a very, in a very specific case, South Africa, um, uh, Palestinian leaders were, were very close to um, a black leaders in South Africa, very much identified with their struggle for independence uh, from, from apartheid. And, uh, and really from there, um, it, was, it, it, it wasn't a, a big step to black communities and African communities where, wherever they might be, and particularly in the United States. But now having said that, of course, it's quite important to point not just to the similarities, but the differences between our two histories. And that matters. Now, in terms of our similarities, I don't have to say again what Christian said so eloquently. Of course, this is in the end a struggle, whether it's we who are doing it, or black people are doing it, or brown people anywhere. It's a struggle against the same folk, uh, 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 white supremacists, um, white co colonists, who have a view that they have the God-given right to uh, take and use uh, uh, countries far from their own shores, and in the case, of course, of Blacks in the United States, take the people from those countries and bring them all the way in, to America. Now, so in a way, while <clears throat> the Black struggle in the United States um, is in the end the struggle of people who many hundreds of years ago, came from an original uh, homeland, but in the time that has elapsed from that initial, um, initial piracy to today, uh, what's happened, of course, is that um, Black Americans identify with being in the United States, which is completely understandable and natural. So for them, the, the racism they experience, the, uh, the, the, the attitudes they have to put up with all the time are ones in which they are trapped because there is no home country. There's no country of origin. They can't say, yes, well, if you continue to behave like this, we don't want to stay here. You can't do that. And what, I understand that very well. The Palestinians on the other hand, of course, have a different uh, problem. Not that they're not fighting the same colonial, supremacist, arrogant forces, but they're in their own land. Half of them are in their own land, and they, they are not free. And the other half are living in exile, and they want to go home. So the home is known, the land is known, but it's in under the control of uh, people who uh, came from elsewhere and uh, set up a state inside Palestine, settler colonialism, the classical settler colonialism, that's what Israel is. Um, and the, the, so our struggle is very much about against these forces that are preventing us from being free in our own homeland and being free to invite our fellow Palestinians in exile back to that homeland. So it's got it's just that got those historical differences. Uh, now, having ha having said that, um, of course, I, I I welcome, but I also understand why Black Lives Matter has an affinity for the Palestinian struggle, um, and that Black activism uh, it, it, it is sympathetic to Palestinian uh, struggle, quite apart from the the commonalities of fighting colonialism, et cetera. Of course, 
the country you're living in, the United States, is absolutely complicit in what Israel does. I mean, I cannot honestly think of an example uh, in modern life where a, a state thousands and thousands of miles away is so intimately involved in the affairs of another state and is so much so strongly on one side against the indigenous people. And so of course, for you, in your, you've got a living example of what, how America behaves and what it's doing to a faraway people, the Palestinians. And it's of course echoes of your own history. And so it seems to me that this is inevitable it's inevitable. And if uh, oppressed people in the United States, for whatever reason, cannot see the, 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 the associations with Palestine, it's because they don't know, they don't realize, they don't think that it's the United States which is keeping Israel going. And you know, it's commonly said in, amongst Palestinians, and it's not a fantasy. If, say, by some miracle, uh, the US administration, said, right, well, we've had enough of Israel. We can't go on paying all this money, sending all these arms. So you, Israel, are on your own. Uh, goodbye. Now, if that, if, if that was ever to happen, we know perfectly well that Israel would be cut right down to size, meaning it would be a pygmy instead of a giant that it is today. And it would take its place, its rightful place, with other, uh, uh, not its rightful. Sorry, it's it's it would go down to the, the its natural size uh, amongst the the states and the peoples of that region. And of course, that would be the end of the whole Israeli experiment. So uh, we're terribly aware of of how crucial uh, the United States help is for Israel. Um, now. You know, we have, of course, uh, a history in which, because it's settler colonialism, in which um, all, all, all this happened since 1948, has uh, persecuted Palestinians in one way or another, wherever they might be. So if you're um, a refugee living in a camp and have been living in that camp for 72 years, without a hope of coming out and of going home, or if you are um, uh, in exile, seemingly rather better off, like I am, you actually are still lost because you're not able to go and live in your own homeland. And if you are living under Israeli rule, well, you experience apartheid at first hand, you experience discrimination, you experience brutality uh, and all of that. Um, now, the question for us, therefore, and for all our friends and anybody who is in solidarity with us, is not really a question of, um, how can I say, people are, have become accustomed to parceling up uh, uh, the, what Israel is doing into categories, into compartments. Now, I understand that because Israel has behaved so badly in every single way that it's very difficult to know where to start. Now, what people tend to opt for is this thing called the occupation. Now, most people understand that to be the 1967 occupation of what uh, was the remains of Palestine, West Bank, Gaza, <clears throat> East Jerusalem. And you know that there are many uh, solidarity movements which talk about ending the occupation, uh, people talking about uh, aiming to help Palestinians live under occupation, all this sort of stuff. And I do want to, I want to say at this point that we people, uh, friends or whoever is in solid has got to drop this kind of vocabulary. The, our problem is not with the occupation after 1967. Our problem is with the nature of the state that oppresses us with the nature of the project that came to Palestine and colonized it and led to all the problems that we have. And that nature is not only settler colonialism, but it's very specifically 
racist, and very specifically, anti-Palestinian. And so, the, so, so the, our issue is with the apartheid, the racism of Zionism, which is the ideology of Israel, and it wouldn't really, it wouldn't help very much if say, let us say again, like I was daydreaming about the United States dropping Israel, let's daydream again. And, and Israel says, okay, I'm leaving the occupied territories. I'm leaving the 1967 territories. You Palestinians can make your own state, goodbye, and we can be friends. Now, the problem is, no, we can't be friends. Even in Israel, shrunk down geographically to whatever size you like, if it remains an apartheid, racist state, Zionist state, we haven't actually succeeded. That is the thing that I want to get across to people. They have to really understand that. So, you know, we, so, so um, uh, in a way, we need to, therefore, you can see that when you understand that, you realize that the Palestinian struggle is not just to end the 1967 occupation, it is against the whole Israeli project, the whole Israeli project, which has an ideology which has damaged the Palestinians and would damage anybody uh, who is in the way of the Zionist project. So it isn't anything specific about us, uh, we were in the way, that was what it was, and had to be got rid of. And of course, the worst aspect of it is the settler colonialist aspect, which is not satisfying to take so much from you, the indigenous people, your land, your resources, whatever you have, it wants you out. It wants to take your land completely without you on it. That's the thrust of Zionism. And people forget that at their peril. It's never really changed and they're doing it. So the annexation that I was asked to mention or to talk about is but a late stage in the project of clearing the land of its native people and having the new people, the settler colonial colonists take their place. That's really what it's about. So, the annexation in itself, what the detail of what they're going to take and what they're going to um, control is, is our details. The, the overall reality is it's a step on the way to the final clearing of the original Palestine. Um, uh, and, and I mean, obviously, I should say that the, 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 just one needs to know that the annexation that's talked about is in fact extending Israeli sovereignty, which is the way they put it, uh, over the large settlements, uh, Jewish settlements in the West Bank, and over the, the, the Jordan Valley. Uh, altogether, this would constitute some 30% of the West Bank, which the Israelis are saying they want to extend their sovereignty to, meaning they want to annex. Um, and uh, the irony is, of course, these uh, territories are already annexed. These settlements, um, the, the Jordan Valley, are all colonized by Israel, and they're all colonies. And so they, 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 they already enjoy <laughs> being under Israeli law. So it's a really a semantic a refinement to talk about now extending sovereign Israeli law, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I want to really end uh, by saying we do need to get our terms right. We need to know what it is we're really talking about here with regard to Israel, uh, and we need to understand that annexation, which is the latest uh, move on the part of the Zionists, annexation is to understand it for what it is. It's nothing, it's nothing new or startling. It's another step on the way to clearing the land of Palestine. So if people then start from that and also start from the nature of Israel, the nature of the Israeli project, Zionism, and what that's all about, then I believe we can really start to get a meaningful 
understanding what's happening and struggle and the, and the, and, and the supportive movements, those movements in solidarity with us, at least they know for sure what it is they're being in, in solidarity about. Uh, and I'm not trying to speak down to anybody. This may be well known, but in my experience, it's not actually articulated as clearly as it could be. <clears throat> and that's really perhaps enough for me to say at the present moment. Thank you, Dr. Carmen. <clears throat> now we will introduce our discussant. Mohamed Nabosi is an attorney and community organizer based in Houston, Texas. He currently serves on the board of the Palestinian American Cultural Center, Houston, and is the vice general coordinator of the Palestinian Youth Movement. Mohammed first became involved in Palestine work during his undergraduate and law school years at the University of Texas at Austin, where he helped lead a divestment campaign targeting corporations complicit in the Zionist occupation of Palestine. Following his time on campus, Mohammed has spent the last few years working to empower the Palestinian and Arab community of Houston and strengthening the role of students and youth in the Palestinian community and struggle more broadly. Mohammed. Thank you so much. Thank you to US ACPI and to uh, all my co-speakers. I'll try to keep this short. I know I have five minutes. Um, I'm really, I'm going to focus on two points. Uh, the first point is um, you know, as Christian has mentioned, the, the struggle of Black people in this country is a struggle against, uh, and not just this country, globally is a struggle against imperialism and colonialism. And really what undergirds that, uh, that notion is that uh, we have a global system um, that facilitates uh, the oppression of uh, the wide, uh, the vast majority of people of the world, including Palestinians. And this system is, is predicated on the use of particular mechanisms, tactics, strategies. It's governed by specific logics and they are applied on different populations depending on where they find themselves on the basis of those contexts. And so the, the dominant variables that are land, resources, labor, these sorts of variables that put us into relationships with imperialism and colonialism is really what is governing the ways in which um, these different, the system itself relates to these different populations. And when we examine these sets of relations closely, that's where we see the similarities. Now there's an intuitive notion of commonality amongst oppressed peoples based on experience, but it's not simply experience that governs that, that uh, our proximity to each other. It's really the system that makes us in uh, places us in relationship to each other. And internationalism, both as a historical vehicle and as a, 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 as a, a, as a notion, isn't predicated simply on shared visions or shared principles or shared values for justice and liberty. That's definitely there. It's actually a strategy, a strategy employed by his, historically by anti-colonial movements because they started to recognize what they were facing in terms of the system that's going against them. And so the US is involvement in the region, it's support for the state of Israel or apartheid South Africa or any of these global state, global South actors, whether it's Saudi Arabia or, or Israel, isn't predicated on um, necessarily the internal workings of those systems of whether Saudi's a monarchy or Israel's an apartheid state, it's predicated on the furtherance of this global system of which the US is at, at the head. And so because of that, because of this sort of global system, it requires on us, you know, as oppressed people, to really organize ourselves in, in a way that is predicated on undermining, opposing the system. And on the basis of not just shared values for justice and liberty, but on a shared strategy for overthrowing the system that oppresses us in different ways, but on the predicated on the same logics, mechanisms, and, and, and tactics, techniques, tools, tear gas, these sorts of things that we are very familiar with intuitively. And this really goes to the next point that I wanna make and it, and it speaks to something that Christian was saying about the, the role of Arab American communities in this specific moment in a moment of black uprising is not necessarily just to focus on turning interpersonally and trying to confront 
uh, prejudices that exists within the Arab, com Arab American community. It's instead to turn them towards investing in black self-determination and struggle. The underlying this point is also the recognition of the system that is destroying black communities in this country or historically have destroyed black uh, communities in this country are rooted in material relations, are rooted in the employment, access to housing, access to education, um, access to wealth and resources. Uh, these sorts of things that, that the system itself thrives on sapping and exploiting these different populations, whether in Palestine, whether in the global south, whether in apartheid South Africa, are the ones that are manifesting here in our neighborhoods across the way. Now, Arab communities, just to speak to this point now, what can P Palestine Solidarity Movement do? What can the Palestinian diaspora do? And I want to distinguish these two. The Palestine Solidarity is has its specific role. The Palestinian diaspora, the communities have their different, uh, different context, right? And it requires different responses. Fundamentally, though, they both need to respond in a way that really integrates the demands and experiences of these different populations into an actual response. So for example, you know, in recent efforts around prison divestment or efforts around divestment from weapons manufacturing companies, things that really get at the heart of what really binds us together, which is that system that's exploiting us, turning it into actual vehicles for bringing ourselves together, not just on the basis of I see you, you see me, we both have struggles. It's not, it's not that. That's all good and well, but actually what's deeper and much stronger than that is the commonality in us forging joint struggle and forging a strategy collectively together to overthrow these systems. Now, the Palestinian diaspora is not organized in the same way as the Palestine Solidarity Movement. And I speak as someone who's involved kind of in both scenes. Palestine Solidarity Movement has its mandate and really does has a responsibility to bring this work. But the role of Palestinian organizers, and I'm going to take a moment here to speak, and I know I'm over time a little bit, to Palestinian organizers. Up until now, Black and Palestine solidarity either exist on the level of the solidarity scene or exist on the level of Palestinian organizers to Black organizers. It doesn't get deeper in terms of trying to forge stronger relationships between our communities. And for the Palestinian organizers, really that means turning to our communities and enlisting them in work that facilitates that. Not just simply turning to them and saying, oh, this is how you should, you should stop using these terminologies or you should not relate to these way, relate to black people in these ways. That's definitely something that needs to be worked on, but Palestinian organizers needs to organize their communities as communities in service, in support of the, of the black struggle in this country. And that takes on its, takes itself on in a very specific way. The Solidarity Movement has its own mandate and own work to do in terms of that and, and bringing Palestine and really intersecting it materially with the Black struggle. Uh, but that, that, that was the last point that I wanna, wanted to make and I'm over time, so that's where I'll leave it. Thank you both for your comments, Fed and Christian. Uh, I really appreciated the things that you had to say and thank you, U.S. Acme, for inviting me to participate in this conversation. Okay, thank you so much, Mohammed. So now I'd like to take some time for uh, Christian and Rada to respond uh, to what Mohammed has said. Christian, would you like to go first? Um, I'm still gathering my thoughts. I, I can, mm -hmm. but uh, Dr. Carmi, if you have any thoughts, you can feel free to go first. Um, well, look, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, for those very thoughtful comments. Uh, what you say, of course, is absolutely right, that uh, when people try to understand each other's struggle, they need to understand that it's not only the detail of each struggle, but rather that there is something that connects them in a much bigger sense. And so your remarks about uh, a global, global way of looking at this, understanding this, this is uh, a, a struggle against the same beast, if I can put it like that, um, without uh, where you have some details in in terms of uh, where where particularly this beast is is being active. But you need to be very clear that there is this one beast, and that uh, what we what we should do, how to fight, how to struggle against it, will will be there will be a commonality. With, uh, with, with, with other struggles because they're struggling against the same thing. 
and it seems to me that that is that is clear and you're very it's quite right that you you put that forward and you put it forward very clearly <clears throat> however uh, i do i think i need to say that uh, for uh, people who are swamped by uh, the, the 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 specific problem they're having to fight then they're swamped for example let's take the palestinians living uh, under Israeli um, military occupation, uh, who really haven't got enough to eat and are worried about their families, etc., they will, will will feel, and that's entirely natural, that they've got enough on their hands, if I can put it like that, trying to fight the immediate oppression, the immediate oppression, and would not stand back. It would be unlikely they'd be able to stand back and say, you know, this is part, of course, a much greater uh, global movement. Um, so it, it really is important to make that point. It's not a, it's not a trivial point. And secondly, the people in the diaspora who support those people, remember that the, the Palestinians uh, have extended families, and very often half of a family is living in exile in the, in the diaspora. The other half <clears throat> is living in Nablus, or, or, or somewhere in, in Palestine as well, and is suffering. So the, 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 um, the one that is in the diaspora, those people are worried about what's happening under Israel's occupation. And again, they're not in Israel. Now, this is, but that is not to detract from the validity of the point that you're making. And in fact, it's much more effective if people understand that there are things that bind them as opposed to having very specific differences and therefore they all unite. And God knows the Palestinians are orphans. They are alone. They are alone. No state endorses the Palestinian struggle. You know, please remember that. There is a lot of talk and a lot of rhetoric, but in practice, there is no formal body, either a state or an institution, which formally has adopted the Palestine cause. They, they are actually on their own in that sense. And in, uh, my criticism of Palestinians is that they must understand that when you're in a position like that, what you do is reach out to friends and allies. You don't just sit and try and fight this, this oppressor and then feel very badly. You make, you, you, you strengthen your struggle by um, um, drawing alliances and friendships and solidarity with other struggles with whose details are different, but where the overall um, uh, structure is the same. And I, I will say, but, but finally, I don't want to go over time. You know, uh, I mean, I'm somebody who very much supported Yasser Arafat. I, um, uh, I know he made mistakes, etc. Et and I know he has a lot of uh, internal enemies, a lot of Palestinians uh, uh, are quite critical. But I always valued that the outlook he had was exactly like the one I'm saying. He cultivated links and alliances with the whole non-aligned movement, as it was in his day, with, 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 with states like Cuba, with South Africa, with uh, uh, every uh, every grouping that uh, was engaged in a struggle against the same enemy, and that's something that he he, he tried to push forward for Palestinians, and it, it certainly influenced the PLO for 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 a long time, and I think everybody should take that example uh, and do the same. Thank you, uh, Dr. Carmi, and thank you, Mohammed, uh, for your comments. Um, I mean, th there's a few overlapping themes in each of your remarks that I, I want to speak to. And one, the first is just um, gratitude that we're all very clear on this panel that the U.S. is the head of the monster, um, and Israel is connected to it, but Israel is not the, the head in this case. Um, the, that Israel serves a very strategic role for United States power and empire in the same way that Saudi Arabia and other um, um, extensions of its imperialism do. Um, but it is the U.S. that is driving um, the, the, or providing material support for 
um, the, the colonization of Palestine. Um, it, it's not some like Israel lobby influence on U.S. politics. It's just fundamentally what the U.S. is about is extending and exerting its power um, against oppressed people around the world. Um, and so if we understand the U.S. in, in that way, um, I, I think what I'm inviting people to understand here is um, the position that people occupy here as non-Black or non-Indigenous people in the U.S. might be similar to three or 400 years from now, um, the position that um, non-Palestinians living in Palestine occupy. So what, what I mean by that is if we look at the racial hierarchy of each of these two um, countries or, or projects, um, in Palestine, we know that Palestinians are at the very bottom of that hierarchy. Um, and then just above that, you have um, the African asylum seekers from Sudan, Eritrea. Uh, above that, you have the Ethiopian Israelis who are considered Israelis, but also, and are able to oppress Palestinians, um, but are also oppressed by um, uh, uh, Arab and, and European uh, Israelis above them. Um, so the, the, the position that so-called people of color occupy in each context is one in which, as long as you're not at the very bottom, you have the ability to participate in directly or at least benefit from passively the suffering of the groups at the bottom. Um, and the, 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 the systems are set up in a way that it, it discourages solidarity or even co-resistance with the oppressed and encourages complicity um, with their oppression. So um, we were very aware that if um, Arab Jews, Ethiopian Jews, asylum seekers banded together to support Palestinians, um, the whole system would crumble in, in, in very quickly. Um, in a similar way, if we have non-Indigenous and non-Black people of color aligning with the, and centering the struggles of, of our two um, communities, um, we could topple this kind of oppressive system much more quickly than in the, the scattered way that we're approaching it right now. Um, and so this relates a little bit to um, notions of organizing within the Palestinian or Arab American communities here. Um, and I, I see you all as having, um, I don't know, there's, there's two kind of mandates. One is, is a uh, responsibility and solidarity with your own struggle um, on the land um, abroad, but it's also, um, just deepening solidarity with the oppressed populations on, on this territory. Um, and to me, I might argue that supporting, the, the best way to support Palestine is actually to invest more time and resources in the local organizing and the local struggles than it is in the, the, the kind of diaspora connections because you are on this territory and um, can play a very specific role in uplifting um, black communities and, and black liberation. Um, and I think in each case, both for the Palestinian context and the Black context, what we're looking for is, 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 is more depth. Um, so um, Dr. Carmi rightly acknowledged that the 67 occupation is not the fundamental issue. It's the whole kind of system and structure. Um, many of us point to the Nakba as the kind of, not the genesis, but one of the core issues at play in injustice in Palestine. Um, but how many of us have relationships with Palestinians in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Greece, who have fled refugee camps and have literally never been to Palestine in 70 years? Um, we need more depth um, in, in centering refugees and right of return in that way. Um, and we also need more depth in um, really engaging in, in Black communities in a deeper way. But I think it's important to note that um, we are operating on different conditions of struggle than the anti-colonial movement. Um, there was a very strong and robust solidarity between our struggles because there were strong and robust liberation movements that were part of a broader third world anti-colonial um, uh, non-aligned um, uh, uh, moment. And um, as a result of the threats that each of those or all of those revolutions posed to the system, we saw a lot of um, counter-revolutionary measures that states and actors have taken um, from the 80s onward. Um, and so that looks like the NGOization of movements where we no longer have um, a black liberation movement, but a movement for black lives that's primarily based in NGOs. It means there's no longer an active Palestinian liberation movement. Instead, thanks to Oslo, we have a very kind of depoliticized Palestinian and fragmented Palestinian context. 
And in each of our cases, most of this work is focused through NGOs. Um, so it, it means that practicing um, solidarity and joint struggle, it, it's much harder to, to get to practicing those in the ways that we need. Um, and so, yeah, I just want us to be aware of, of that context. And I think that's why this moment requires going into, onto the community level um, and building community power to help get us back to um, just being equipped to, to fight these struggles in a, in a larger way. Yeah, I mean, can I can I come in again? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, you you've actually, Christian, you you um, reminded me you put your finger on something extremely important, which is of course uh, uh, the consequence of um, of of the of the oppressive structure, the 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 oppressive, the um, arrogant. Um, uh, structure that rules uh, in a, that, that that creates problems for all these groups, and it is of course um, the the way it creates um, groups within the oppressed group who become oppressors themselves uh, of their own people, and of course this is well known throughout history, and that's why. Uh, classic colonial powers, let, let's take Algeria as a very good example, um, would, would, all go, uh, would go out of their way to create a particular class of <clears throat> indigenous people whose job was to be loyal to the co uh, colonizer and to keep their people down. And of course, tragically, that's what's happened in Palestine. You, you've got uh, the, the Palestinian Authority, which is an Exactly an illustration of precisely this process. Um, and uh, when you mentioned the Ethiopian Jews, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. If those people who are extremely oppressed, and indeed what we call the Arab Jews, that's the, 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 the ones who came from Arab lands originally and their um, descendants, if they, they're also oppressed by the same supremacists that rule them and rule us, they could just understand that we are suffering from the same problem. Let's get together. But you know very well what's happened. The Ethiopians look down on the Palestinians. And so uh, the, the, the state has several layers of oppression between it directly and the oppressed people. And that is an absolute feature of this whole phenomenon. Thanks for uh, pointing it out. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the Q&A stack and just start asking some questions that have been posted there. So I'll just start with the first one uh, from David Klein. Uh, Malcolm X fam famously said, quote, you can't have capitalism without racism, unquote. If the speakers agree, can they address the role of capitalism, more specifically in the oppression of Palestinians by Israel and the oppression of blacks in the US? Is a genuine anti-racist movement possible without being anti-capitalist? Yeah, I um, can start us off. And Brother Malcolm, I don't know if you can see. Oh yeah, he's right there. Um, so. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that goes both ways. You, this, you can't have racism without capitalism, but, and you can't have capitalism without racism. And um, black people almost more than anyone, I think should understand that principle very deeply um, because it is only through um, profits from the, the, the slave trade um, that was rooted in racism that the US and many of the European uh, powers were able to ex expand their reach and, and, and their imperial conquests around the world. Um, not just through slavery, but also through um, colonizing Africa and stealing its resources um, and similar kind of missions across Asia and, and Latin America. Um, so it's literally impossible for us to divorce the conditions that we experience <laughs> under racism from the underlying system and structures of capitalism. Um, in the sense that, uh, yeah, just at this point, like five or six centuries um, deep into this history, um, 
it's it's a little similar to what um, Dr. Carmen was saying about about Palestine. If if somehow all of these nations say, sure, okay, we have a, a an on and off switch for racism, we're switching it off, um, but leaving all the other conditions in in the same way. Um, not much changes for us as oppressed people. We still um, are living in contexts where we have inadequate access to just basic resources for survival. Um, we still are living in a context where we have had literally centuries of wealth stolen, not just from us individually, but from our peoples, our communities, and our nations. Um, and so unless you kind of correct the centuries of theft and economic exploitation, um, we're, we're bound to just exist in, in the same kind of um, context that we do. And I think South Africa is a good model of this, um, where more than 20 years after the, the formal end of apartheid, um, the kind of economic structure of the country is still the same with um, a, a vast majority of white wealth. Um, for the vast majority of, of people in South Africa are living in poverty, and in many cases, worse poverty than they did 20, 25 years ago. Um, and the point is that without economic redistribution, without economic justice, in my argument, without socialism, um, th there is no kind of justice for victims of colonialism or, or racism. And that's why in the, the third world liberation movement, um, pretty much every liberation struggle uh, uh, used socialism as, as um, both a tool and a vehicle and a destination for what um, liberation and self-determination would look like for our people collectively. Yeah. Uh, um, and it's a it's a very good point, uh, and it's 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 a complex issue, but I want to just simplify it. Um, look, capitalism is about amassing wealth, right? Now, if in amassing wealth uh, you 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 find uh, situations which you can exploit in order to amass wealth, that's the way it it works. So, so, for example, the early capitalists were not um, engaged, the uh, very early capital, when capitalism started, to, it started at, at, at local, at domestic level, where um, in England, for example, about whose history I, I think I know more than, than, than the other, <laughs> other countries' histories that I was very ignorant of. But you had somebody who was like your local mill owner, that is, somebody who owned a mill um, and then employed people in, in, in the village where or the area where he lived and then um, amassed wealth from their labor uh, and gave them less than they deserved uh, and so on. Now, that is the essence of capitalism is that, it's that operation. Now, if you find a rich source in uh, going abroad and 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 finding uh, people living in countries with lots of resources, you have no um, hesitation in exploiting that. So you, you want to take their resources, and in so doing, you will um, look down on their rights, uh, ignore, uh, take no account of the fact that it doesn't belong to you; it belongs to them. So in that sense, uh, this is how my understanding is of the link between capitalism and uh, supremacy, race, race, racial supremacy. Meaning that the capitalists would say, we are entitled to it, uh, we are entitled and the others are there to serve us. So it's, 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 it's sort of in that sense. Now, my point is that if the people you're exploiting happen to be white in your own country and, and poor, you'll do that. It's not racism against whites, it's exploitative, that's really what it is. Now, in the case of Palestine and all settler colonialism, the impetus is, uh, of course, to take over a, a, a territory, uh, and, but it's not to exploit local labor. That's not the, imp that is not the, the, the primary reason, although local labor can be quite handy. But what you're really doing it for is you want the whole territory with its resources for you and you want to get rid of them so that you can take their place. In that sense, uh, by the way, I should have mentioned this before, that's why the United States is also so close to Israel. Very similar story. 
well, I don't have to point that out, it's obvious. Um, and so, uh, um, and, and, and I would just say the mistake, if you like, that Israel made, it didn't exterminate the Palestinians. If it had done that, it would have less trouble. It never went the whole way. The Palestinians stayed, they, some of them, a third, a third of them stayed on their land, and the ones outside were helping the ones inside. And so they have a huge problem today. But anyway, that's just an aside. Um, so I don't know if the, the, the question is satisfied by that answer, but that's the way I look at it. Mohammed, would you like to uh, respond at all to this question? Yeah, I mean, I think that the broader point that I was making in my initial comments was getting at this. Uh, and when I say imperialism, I'm, I'm referring to, to global capitalism. Um, imperialism is not just uh, the one state imposing its will on another. It's, it's actually a much more complicated system, which at its root, the predicate um, uh, system is an economic one uh, and not a military, military one. Now, military is used as the vehicle to enforce the economic system on the globe. Um, but, uh, you know, in Palestine and, and settler colonial regimes, they work a little different. But even then, when you really get into the details of the settler colonial enterprises, uh, labor and land are the dominant variables. Labor often imported. Uh, in the case of settler colonialism in America or in, the, in, in Turtle Island, the labor force that was that was required in order to engage in westward expansion was an imported slave labor, uh, a kidnapped uh, population. In the case of uh, Palestine, um, obviously the dominant settler colonial logic required the displacement and dispossession of Palestinians at the same time that they were working to import un uh, Arab Jews into Palestine to supplement that labor in a moment in which you know European Jews didn't have neither the skill set nor the um, capacity to engage in the sort of labor that Arab Jews could in that moment in the early 20th century and late late 19th century, so this sort of logic also exists in Palestine. And there's also a history of obviously exploitation of Palestinians, um, Palestinian labor uh, by the occupation, uh, but it doesn't necessarily work in the same way. I, I, fundamentally, I just just to reiterate my point, global system of capitalism, which in, in this current stage is uh, imperialism, is really what, uh, you know, undergirds the ways that these different states, entities relate to these populations. So I, I definitely agree, capitalism and racism uh, are integral to each other and, and um, reinforce each other. Okay, thank you, Mohammed. I'm going to ask um, a couple of questions now. One, each one is directed to a different speaker. So, one for Dr. Carmi. I'll just read each question, and then you can each of you can respond in turn. Uh, so, uh, for Dr. Carmi, what are practical methods to advocate for Palestinians in occupation and for refugees? with the US government if you do not advocate to end the occupation. Uh, for Christian, how do you suggest we advocate for black lives and other minorities in our communities and with the US government? I look forward to reading your article. Uh, and for Mohammed, could you please define Palestine solidarity movement versus the diaspora? So anyone can just jump in and ask, answer his or her question. I can be really brief and answer my question in like one minute. Uh, the, the Palestine solidarity scene refers to, or the, the movement refers to those who are working in solidarity with Palestinians, amplifying the calls uh, of Palestinians in Palestine. Uh, really a lot of the initiatives in, in, the, in, the, in the ways that the movement works contemporarily in the post Oslo moment is through the solidarity scene. Now the Palestinian diaspora is a different different altogether. That refers to the people who either immigrated or were exiled from Palestine uh, into you know, the entire world. And so 
we have communities here. We have communities that are bound together by institutions, by cultural relations, by you know a sort of a society outside of our, our our nation. And so that is the diaspora. It has uh, both a mandate to engage in internal Palestinian politics, meaning what do we want for our struggle? Where do we want it to go? What are our rights? What are the things that we do not forfeit? Like the right of return, for example. Now, a solidarity activist who is not Palestinian does not have the right of return, but a Palestinian does. And so there's a distinction there being to be made. And there's a distinction in the way that we organize ourselves, relate to ourselves and things like that. So th those are the differences between the two. I can go. Um, let me just make sure I have the question right. Yeah, okay, so um, to me, it's not an issue of advocating for black communities. To me, it's in a question of investing in black communities so that we can advocate for and liberate ourselves. Um, like if, if we look at the last, moment of meaningful, not only black organizing, but black and Palestinian joint struggle, which is the moment with, with the Black Panthers, uh, like meeting the PLO in, in Algiers or visiting Palestinian uh, uh, freedom fighters in Lebanon. Um, this solidarity and this very like strong um, um, acts of, of work for liberation emerged because there was a liberation movement. Um, and it emerged because communities were um, I mean, still lacking resources, but had enough resources to um, organize themselves, to support their communities, to do political education with their communities, um, to really kind of raise the level of consciousness and struggle. Um, so that doing something like joining a PLO delegation in Algiers like, is something that, that makes sense. Um, so for us to really have a, a shot at like, freedom and, and liberation, we have to work as hard as we can to bring back um, the conditions that allow for that level of, of struggle. And to me, that isn't, um, like, yes, there's, there's ways in which, like, lifting up uh, movement for Black Lives policy demand or platforms are, are useful. But um, to me, I, I think the more helpful thing is, like, just viewing our community as an ecosystem um, that has many seeds in it. It has some plants that are strong, some that are weak. Uh, but that really needs to be nourished and watered and supported in order to thrive. Um, and we're currently in a moment of malnourishment. Um, but if we invest in, a, in this, this I think is the most tangible way of, of supporting. It's, it's um, investing time, money, and very specifically, and most importantly, relationships in uh, uh, Black grassroots organizing in your own city. Um, so it's, it's looking to see who is trying to do political education in their community or to uplift their community in, in, in terms of self-sufficiency, um, who is thinking about Black uh, liberation or, or um, revolution in a deep and structural way, what projects are they involved in and how can I support them? Um, and just using um, my experience in, in Detroit as an example, um, to me, it's the, the people who are focused on um, questions or issues of black land in cities, whether that's through um, community gardens or urban farms, but are, are thinking on the broader structural level of like food and land security for the community. Um, those are the folks that tend to already have very deep analyses of capitalism and colonialism in the country who might have the elders that are were involved in internationalist politics in the 60s and 70s. Um, it's really like investing resources into the groups that can, um, yeah, just just give us the, the, the conditions in which black liberation can flourish in a, in a deeper way um, is the most important thing to, to be doing right now. Dr. Carmi. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much for, for your question. I can see why you've asked it because it, it, it sort of almost sounds as if I'm saying, uh, never mind about the occupation. Let's let's be thinking about the the bigger picture. No, of course not. In it, I mean, the the actual occupied areas are militarily occupied, and they they have a very particular experience of oppression, uh, which deserves 
uh, help, assistance, solidarity in its own right. There's no question. Now, it see, of course, there are, and then that is why there are really many um, projects, initiatives, which have be been really designed to um, either highlight the problems of the people under occupation or focus on international law and Israel's occupation, all this stuff. There are lots of things around, but the one I particularly want to draw your attention to is of course the boycott, divestment and the sanctions movement. BDS has as one of its specific aims to end, to end the occupation of, um, of, of uh, to end the occupation and then to talk about the right of return, etc. But BDS, which is an excellent, excellent, I don't have to uh, stress how important it is and it, if it, and it needs to be strengthened all the time, all the time. Um, and I'm always mindful of the anti-apartheid movement uh, in South Africa and how much of a difference it made. Um, and we need to expand BDS and, and, and do all of that. Now, however, <clears throat> if I were to, I, I didn't make the point when I was speaking, and I don't know whether there's enough time to do this, but you see, fundamentally, when I said, um, you know, uh, you know, when I said ignore the occupation, well, not ignore the occupation, but the issue is not the occupation of part of Palestine, it's the whole Zionist project. Uh, I didn't, of course, in, I, I would, I should have said, I don't mean that you therefore ignore Gaza, for example, which has a horrendous problem with the siege. Uh, and so you really, that needs solidarity and help. I hope that's clear. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we only have a, a few more minutes. Uh, so I would like to just ask each of you uh, if you have um, anything, any kind of concluding remarks that you would like to make uh, briefly before we say goodbye. Okay, then, then let me start uh, by saying, I'm, I'm sorry that we only have a few minutes, but um, you know, real uh, solidarity with the Palestinians, or not real, but very useful solidarity, would be to help them to put right an anomalous situation in which they live and which everybody in a way somewhat ha accepts. Um, you know, the, the, the um, Israeli occupation of the 1967 territories, uh, apart from the fact it's oppressive and all the rest of it, it is, is doing something quite extraordinary, which somehow people don't particularly discuss, or not many people, is that the territory between the Mediterranean, the river, the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, okay, that territory is entirely ruled by Israel. The territory includes the Palestinians, the ones the, that Israel has ruled since 1967, and the Jewish Israelis, and Palestinian Israelis, right? That's the reality. But I invite you to remember about half of this, of this whole population, statistically, they're nearly half. The Palestinians under occupation are ruled by Israel without any rights whatsoever. They don't have citizenship. They don't have basic rights. Uh, whereas Jewish Israelis have citizenship and rights and Jewish and Israeli Palestinians have, okay, secondary citizens, but they have rights. How come that we've accepted a situation in which Israel, the one sovereign, rules an area, half of whose people are disenfranchised completely? What about that? It seems to me that if we could start with that, and support a campaign for equal rights, very familiar in a United States uh, concept, uh, context. If you had a struggle amongst Palestinians currently under occupation, stateless and without rights, to say, we need to have rights. We need equal rights with citizens who you, Israel, are ruling. That equal, equal rights struggle 
I think should be the struggle of the future. And that is the one that everybody should be able to support and help the Palestinians to gain their equal rights in this one expanded state. Thank you very much, Dr. Carmi. Christian or Mohammed, would you like to give any concluding remarks? Uh, Mohammed, you can go first. Um, I, ju I just first, uh, obviously, thank you again for hosting this uh, webinar, and I'm so glad to have joined. Um, the only comment that I'll conclude with is um, just reiterating what the notion of self-determination, the principle of self-determination means. It really means that uh, those of us who are on the receiving end of a system of oppression uh, bear the brunt and also are responsible for organizing our way out of it. And that means both in defining how we get out of it and where we want to go. And uh, any sort of effort to overcome the systems that are oppressing our people requires the organization and the mobilization of our people. And that in turn means that any sort of effort, and, and this is something that Christian has, has uh, reiterated throughout his comments, requires the support of those of us within our struggles who are seeking to reaffirm the principles of self-determination and the need to be able to speak as the as Palestinians or as black people or as whatever it requires in our demands and in our formulation of the path forward and what liberation actually entails. Thank you. Um, let's see. Yeah, so um, just I appreciated this conversation and, and specifically um, being in conversation with you, Dr. Karmi and Mohammed. Um, I think to be more concrete with um, a way to support Black struggle, um, I don't know, let's challenge everybody to spend the next few weeks researching Black organizing in your own city and maybe to commit to in August um, bringing together members of your own community to show up in support of Black organizations, whether it's volunteering, whether it's hosting a fundraiser, or um, mostly one of those two things, but really just building intentional relationships um, with Black organizers in, in your city. Um, especially doing this as Palestinians or as Palestine Solidarity activists, this is how you bring material connection or political education to people in our community who might not know about Palestine to be someone who is Palestinian or in ser service of Palestine, um, being in solidarity, tangible solidarity with our, our struggle. Um, I also wanna encourage us to think a little broadly about the, the, the black struggle. Like on the macro level, we're refugees. Um, we were forced from our homelands and we have been living in kind of exile uh, diaspora status for, for hundreds of years. Um, we are a landless people. We are a stateless people um, who never had any opportunity to exercise self-determination in terms of setting up our own system of governance. Um, and just borrowing some language from a, a, a comrade who does work on reparations, uh, his name is Ed Whitfield. Um, he says, in thinking about self-determination, you think about the right to bear the fruit of your own labor. Um, and so that's really the kind of the core essence of the struggle in Palestine is to be able to live um, your own life with your own community and dignity in the way that you choose. Um, that's also what we are, are seeking or moving towards as, as Black folks. Um, because our conditions of colonialism have gone on for much longer, um, we're at the point where most of us ourselves don't understand that we're colonized. Um, our movement doesn't, doesn't necessarily have clear um, demands or visions around self-determination. But what I'm encouraging everyone to do is to find the, the comrades and organizations that do um, and to help nourish them so that they can grow and, 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 and kind of spread that work throughout the, the Black movement and Black community. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all three of you, Christian Davis Bailey, Radhikarmi, and Mohammed Nabilsi for taking your time today, for being such outstanding intellectuals and for 
raising so many questions for us today that I think are not answered and that push us forward to perhaps another US ACB webinar in the future. Thank you so much uh, and goodbye everyone. Thank, every, thank you for all, all of you who've attended the webinar today. Thank you. Thank you so much.